All right, guys, bang, bang. I've got Nick here with me. Thank you so much for doing this. Hey, how are you? So I want to start first with uh, this idea that uh, you've built one of the largest unicorns in Europe uh, and specifically have this idea of uh, kind of a financial super app, right? Anyone in the world can show up to Revolut store uh, and you're able to service their financial service needs. Maybe let's just talk about where the idea for this came from and, and kind of why you're going after this uh, opportunity. So initially it started from my own problem. So obviously now I was expat living in the UK. So I traveled uh, abroad and also I sent their money abroad a lot. And I was always pissed off by commissions. The banks charged me. And then I came up with a, with a simple solution. It's effectively a global account plus a card which allowed you to send and spend money uh, at interbank rates. Uh, but then our last five years, we really expanded the, the product to, to super up concept. So the new value proposition is uh, rather simple. So we give you all your financial services products that you need for your daily life, or 10 times cheaper and 10 times better to, compared to banks or stockbrokers or so on. Uh, and then the idea is that all these products are highly personalized to your needs because they all talk with each other. So we actually save you a lot of time by just you know, opening one account within two minutes for uh, Revolut Retail. And then secondly, we allow you to have all these products either for free or at significantly discounted prices compared to banks. So you can trade with us, stock trading for free, obviously no currency exchanges for free and so on and so on. So we save you money and then we make it in a nice user-friendly way. For sure. And what's so fascinating is you talk about kind of your prior experience really driving a lot of uh, not only the philosophical uh, approach that you have, but a lot of the features that you guys have built. Um, you spent time uh, as an equity derivatives trader at uh, Lehman and a few other places. Uh, when you started to build out the actual financial service technologies, how much of your experience uh, from the trader side kind of played into this versus it was just more of your personal experience with financial service platforms? A good question. To be honest, you're, when I started doing this business, uh, I was shocked because you know I, I didn't really knew anything. So I didn't know payments, so I didn't know acquiring, so I had to learn everything from scratch. So the idea to start this business was, uh, well, obviously I was a equity derivatives trader and I realized how much money I wasted on banking fees. But that's the only thing that actually helped me to build this business. Everything else I had to learn from scratch. Yeah. So if I'm a uh, retail investor today uh, or a business owner, I can use uh, the software that you guys have built. Let's start maybe with the retail trader first uh, or, or kind of a regular investor, an everyday person. I come in, what are all the features that are available to me? So ultimately for uh, stock traders and crypto traders, uh, at the moment we give you access to all our US stocks. We're shortly uh, giving you access to uh, European stocks. So the whole idea is that account is global for you to trade, right? So you obviously, if you're in the US, you load your dollars, but then you can trade every asset out there without actually incurring commissions and then without incurring FX fees. Just to give you some numbers to compare. So whenever you open at the moment US stockbroker account uh, and you trade, for example, European-based stocks, Australian stocks, or J Japanese stocks, uh, there is a currency conversion fee involved and it, at least half percent, sometimes it's one percent. So whatever you trade, your two-way ticket is at least one percent cost to you. So we help you to, to avoid this cost. And plus on top of it, we always have a very nice uh, interface, very easy to use. Got it. And so what is what like is the difference of the user behaviors that you've seen uh, over the last 12, 18 months, right? Obviously, we've got uh, kind of COVID happened. You saw all sorts of uncertainty. Um, but then also we saw this kind of historic monetary policy decisions uh, across different geographies. What changed in user behavior uh, or the specific kind of insights that you have uh, watching how users use the uh, use the platform over the last 12 to 18 months? So basically, because we have one app combining all the financial services that people use in, in, in their daily lives, so we can clearly observe a change in, in their behaviors. So first, obviously, spending went down a lot, like all, all the categories such as travel, restaurants, bars, decreased at least by 60-70%. And then we see a lot of people starting actually putting this money into their uh, stock trading account and then uh, buying stocks. So interest in stock trading probably doubled or tripled during this period of time. Crypto 
at least three to five X compared to what we've seen uh, pre-COVID. So in short, people are, have excess money because they cover spending and now they put this excess money into assets, trading assets. Yeah, what's so fascinating is uh, here in the United States, we definitely saw savings rate went up, personal income rate went up, uh, and then you have kind of hard data and you can actually see and measure on the platform that a lot of that excess cash was going right into stock trading accounts or into crypto trading accounts. But it sounds like um, the crypto accounts actually had kind of a higher lift than the stock trading accounts. Is that just kind of a base effect where crypto was smaller before and so it's easier to kind of multiply it? Or was there actually more cash inflow into crypto than, uh, than maybe the stock accounts? accounts yeah i think we saw probably double our cash flow in crypto compared to wow. stock in floor so if you look at our balances and compare crypto versus stocks so the crypto will be double compared to stocks I mean, that, that's pretty incredible. Um, talk to me about the uh, the business account. So I think this is probably one of the most fascinating parts of what you guys are doing, where uh, most folks who have tried to build uh, kind of these super apps or one-stop shops for financial services, they really pick one vertical, right? So they say, hey, we're going to go after retail, uh, or we're going to go after kind of the institutional client, or we're going to go after enterprises. Uh, and those are really kind of three different platforms. You guys have uh, these business accounts right next to the individuals. And so maybe talk a little bit about what a business can do on the platform platform uh, and then kind of why adding business accounts alongside of what the everyday person could use. So the main value proposition is again uh, allowing businesses to use all financial services they need under one umbrella. So you can open an account within five minutes online and then you've got access obviously to your bank accounts and multiple currencies. You can do payments globally plus you can acquire uh, cards or acquire payments online or offline with our acquiring solution. So think about it as Citigroup plus Stripe plus your payroll provider under, under one umbrella, and they're at price significantly cheaper compared to, to any other providers. Uh, so that's advantage number one. And advantage number two, we are allowing you to do global business from, from day one, because obviously all the accounts are global, right? Have multiple currencies, you can uh, send and receive payments from your local suppliers. And then also you can sell globally as well. You can sell in US, you can sell in UK, you can sell in Europe, Australia, and so on. And plus on top of it, we save you a lot of money because of all this you know, cross-border fees, cross-currency fees. Uh, overall, it's a very uh, beneficial products, especially for people who just start their own business. We give them a build to sell globally. Yeah, what's so fascinating about this is obviously coming out of COVID, uh, it seems like remote work, uh, kind of the digital economy uh, has become much more prevalent and a lot of businesses that maybe weren't online uh, now are coming online very quickly, but also people starting businesses, you're, they're basically global on day one, right? I remember maybe a decade ago or maybe even you know eight, eight years ago, uh, businesses basically, let's say, would start in the United States, they would penetrate the US market and it would be a pretty big decision, almost like an executive or a board level decision. Okay, this is going to be the year of international expansion. They would try to go push into other markets. But today, businesses basically, when they turn on, on day one, they're global. And so having that financial infrastructure, it sounds like that's really what you guys are trying to serve is being able to have a global business from day one and not have to worry about all of the various countries, the different accounts and all the different fee structures. Exactly. Yeah, that's exactly our value proposition for, 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 for businesses. Plus on top of it, we also automate all your process. So we automate your payroll, we automate your acquiring, we automate your bank account. So you don't really need to run kind of any spreadsheets or any uh, programmatic interfaces for software outside of Revolutive Business. Yeah. One of the best ways to build a valuable company is to just replace whatever spreadsheets people have buried somewhere in their uh, inside of their business, for sure. Uh, speaking of uh, kind of different geographies, I know that one of the focuses for uh, Revolut during 2021 has been geographic expansion. Uh, you've recently come to the United States. I know that you're pushing into Asia. Maybe talk a little bit about uh, kind of the penetration that you have uh, in Europe and then uh, really what the catalyst has been for your own geographic expansion globally. Uh, so if you look at Europe, we are quite penetrated into Europe. And then in some countries, we achieve uh, more than 50% of our penetration. So for example, if you look at Ireland, one in every two adults in Ireland, they're they using uh, Revolut products. And then the reason why we're actually running these two products, one retail and one business, is effectively two ecosystems. So our goal is to pull these two ecosystems together and enable businesses and consumers to transact without intermediaries. So what it means in practice, uh, 
consumers and businesses will be able to avoid all the acquiring fees or issuing fees, scheme fees. As a result, the transactions become effectively uh, free and instant. And secondly, what we're trying to achieve, we're trying to uh, enable businesses to sell directly to, to Revolut customers um, through a very simple product, very similar to what Facebook or Google do. But we, we call it the mission odds when the, when the mission uh, can go in the, in the business account and then set up certain budget and then put certain discounts on their products. Then these products will be automatically matched with the types of people who have similar transactions before. And uh, this metric is actually much more precise compared to Google and Facebook because uh, we own transactions of consumers. We know what, where they spend, what, what they like. As a result, conversion for purchasing uh, becomes much higher compared to Google and Facebook. And it's a win-win for merchants they make a sale. And then for customers, they, they get uh, a purchase at the discounted price. Got it. And so when you start to think about uh, the various geographies, one of the things that uh, in the United States specifically, but I think also some of the European companies um, that the knock against them or the critique is, oh, these fintech companies, you know, they're trying to skirt the law. They're trying to kind of avoid the regulations that a traditional financial institution would have to uh, follow. For you, though, I think that you guys, uh, I've read online, have applied for a U.S. bank uh, license. I think in Europe, you've also uh, applied for that license. And so maybe talk a little bit just about uh, the idea behind getting the banking license and, and kind of really, it almost feels like take brand new technology and kind of superior uh, user experience and software, but also leverage all of the uh, kind of components of the legacy system and, and kind of bring this together to provide the best experience for, uh, for users. Well, ultimately, when we initially launched the product, we launched it without banking license, and uh, it was a partnership with the bank, or, or in some countries, it was like a lighter license. So what we learned is that it's, it's very difficult or almost impossible to, to merge our tech with existing legacy uh, compliance and infrastructure of banks. So partnerships are usually very difficult to do because we are very differently built, and our systems don't really talk with Spreadsheets of banks, uh, there's a problem. Um, so we, we decided to go for banking license in, every, in almost every single country where we're in, purely to, to control infrastructure and to provide the best experience for consumers. Plus, on top of it, banking license allow you to monetize better and also provide the deposit insurance for, for, for your consumers. Yeah, makes uh, makes a ton of sense. Um, one one of the things that's fascinating to me is uh, it feels like over the last twelve months, fifteen months, uh, you saw all of that user behavior changing from uh, what I'd consider kind of the more traditional financial services, uh, things like the deposit accounts, et cetera, uh, and a big shift into the crypto trading and uh, stock trading. Talk a little bit about uh, almost a renewed focus it seems like you guys have on those products and, and kind of what you're building there to help service some of the clients and, and really just empower them to do what they're trying to do on the platform. Yeah, so we're obviously, as we observe consumers going into or effectively wealth management, uh, stock trading, crypto trading, we increase our efforts in uh, building new products for them. For example, recently we launched uh, social trading. So the way it works, uh, you're able to see a uh, leaderboard with all top traders on Revolut. And then you'll be able to follow them and then uh, see what they do, what they buy, what they sell, see composition of their portfolio, see, see their returns. Uh, so in short, you can uh, you know just, just follow what they do. Um, that's number one. Number two, we're obviously uh, are into crypto. So at the moment, we have well, quite quite a large number of our tokens. And then we're working actually on uh, enabling uh, everyone to deposit uh, crypto in our wallet and withdraw crypto uh, from, from our wallet. Plus, on top of it, we're working on uh, paying interest on, the, on the, your deposits in crypto. So this kind of high-level overview of what we've done and what are our plans. Got it. And then when you start to see uh, the stock and crypto trading, um, I don't know if you know this data off the top of your head, but uh, I'm assuming that most of the users that are really kind of pushing into the crypto trading are probably younger. Uh, they probably have smaller balances. Uh, I think we kind of see this across the industry. Uh, but is there a lot of overlap between the people who are using the crypto trading features and the crypto trading accounts with the stock? Or do you feel like these are pretty segmented and you know, some people want to trade stocks, some people want to trade crypto, but there's not a ton of overlap there? It's rather segmented, I would say. So we, we see a lot of interest uh, from crypto and then we, we see a lot of people trading uh, stocks. So usually, uh, if you look at data, probably 
you look at crypto traders, probably 80% just trade crypto and 20% that trade stocks and crypto. Yeah. It's pretty uh, pretty crazy to think how segmented it is. Almost two different kind of worlds, two different financial systems being built there. Um, what, what's uh, been kind of the lessons that you've seen from the GameStop, the AMC, uh, kind of all these meme stocks and, and kind of the Reddit crowd? Uh, I'm assuming that's driving some tailwind in uh, in stock trading in general. But any lessons learned there or insights uh, as this has kind of become more prevalent in financial markets? Well, lesson number one is your infrastructure should be as stable as possible, right? And then be able to take uh, 10x and even you know 20x load when these things happen because otherwise you know if your infrastructure cannot handle the load then you'll have a lot of complaints from consumers you'll have problems with the uh, regulators so generally it makes sense to overpay for your cloud providers but to be able to to have very high load yeah and so really it's a, a technical infrastructure uh, kind of problem more than anything right it sounds like uh kind of these surges of interest is something that previously either hadn't happened or, or were hard to kind of anticipate and the approach that you guys have taken is just uh almost overkill right have so much infrastructure availability and have the elasticity to kind of bring it online as quickly as possible to serve these moments of surge of interest in, in trading volume yeah exactly so it, uh, it, it actually makes sense to to run at huge overcapacity, just yeah. to ensure that our peak loads is fulfilled. Hey guys, what's going on? Before we continue with this awesome episode, I want to quickly talk about our sponsor, Kraken. For the last 10 years, Kraken has built one of the best platforms to buy and sell cryptocurrencies online. They've got a brand new mobile app, the Kraken app. Today, you can go on and buy Bitcoin or up to 60 of the most popular cryptocurrencies in the world. And you can do that on the go 24-7. All you have to do is simply download the app, connect your bank account, and you can get started investing with as little as $10. It only takes a minute to get started. With the new Kraken app, you'll have your portfolio in your pocket. You can track your portfolio, see who the winners and losers are every day, track your favorite project, or just simply look at the trading volume for your favorite assets. It has all the features you need without any of the complexity. It's simply the best place to buy and sell cryptocurrencies. So, Go to kraken.com slash bang bang to learn more or go to your favorite app store and simply search the word Kraken and you can download the mobile app there. Kraken's been a longtime supporter of this show. So to say thanks, it would mean the world to me if you would go and download their new mobile app. All right, let's get back into this episode. I hope you're enjoying this one. I want to switch gears, talk a little bit about 2020 and into 2021. Uh, you're the CEO of a multi-billion dollar company uh, that has you know tens of millions of users. Uh, you guys do, I think, uh, hundreds of millions of transactions per year. Uh, any lessons learned over the last 12 to 15 months in terms of uh, the pandemic uh, and the monetary policy kind of experiments that are going on, right? As you sit in that kind of CEO seat, um, when you look back over the, that time period, like what, what are some of the lessons that you take away and you're like, wow, you know, uh, this was either surprising to me or things that I wish I had known uh, going into the year? I think what I learned personally and what the whole company learned is uh, it pays off to be extremely uh, are tight in costs, right? You know, before 2020, uh, we're running as, as a usual startup, right? So we were hiring a lot of people. We didn't really care about, you know, costs. But as, as, as COVID hit, and obviously our business was very payment dependent. So with the revenues, you know, going down um, 40%. So we were uh, very fast at, you know, cutting costs, you know, ensuring that our in, in economy is great, is great. But ultimately for, for startups that are less fast, it could have been in a very troubling experience. So even though know, COVID is now almost over, we still are very tight with costs and the unit economics. Yeah, it's interesting you describe kind of pre-COVID uh, uh, that you were more of a payments business. Would it be fair to say that uh, you would categorize yourself as someone had asked, you know, two years ago, hey, we're more of a payments business than anything, and now this is more of kind of a brokerage type business? Or, or how would you think about that transition between uh, where you get most of the volume and revenue from for the business? Initially, we're definitely into, into payments business more than our 70% of uh, revenue came from payments. Now we make probably less than 30% from payments and then the rest is being made on uh, other, other types of businesses. So we definitely diversified uh, a lot and COVID actually helped us to, to shift as well. Yeah. It's uh, it's fascinating to kind of see, uh, you know, you guys probably won't get enough credit, but uh, to, 
you know, make a transition like that uh, with the speed that you did, given the size that you were and the user base that you had, uh, I'm sure it's not easy. Um, one of the other things that's fascinating to me about you specifically is uh, as the CEO of a multi-billion dollar business and one of the largest unicorns in Europe, do you feel pressure to kind of be successful because you feel like uh, that the European tech industry is kind of counting on you to to be the example of, hey, successful companies can be built here in Europe? Or, or how do you think about uh, kind of the position that you're in or the company's in, uh, in light of kind of the local tech community uh, across all the European countries? Well, to be honest, I, I never think about it. Uh, European tech versus you know, Asian tech versus uh, US tech. Uh, another way in business, and then we need to compete within this niche. And we want to be number one in it. And then I focus every day on you know, ensuring that the company produces number one product. And then our financials are also number one across you know, the category of digital banking. Yeah. And, and when you think about that, what, what are some of the things in the future or kind of on the horizon that uh, will help kind of vault you guys to number one and stay there uh, in terms of features? Are there things that the user base wants uh, that, that you're excited about or, or kind of thinking through how to bring that to them? We've got quite a few. For example, our product number one that we already built and we are in testing phase. So it's travel related. So we we, we, we bet that you know, a lot of people will return to travel and then there will be a huge spike in travel activities. So we build a product uh, within our marketplace, within our hub, to effectively have equivalent of booking.com or Expedia. So it's our interface, everything is ours. You can book stays or hotels, you know, houses at the same price as booking.com and Expedia. Plus on top of it, you can get 10% cash back instantly. So it's exactly the same experience same prices plus on top of it, uh, 10% cash back. So that's product number one. Product number two that we built during a uh, pandemic uh, is actually credit related. Uh, so basically it's called seller advance. And then the way it works, uh, as soon as you connect your salary to, to our account, uh, you are able to withdraw your salary much, well, before that your salary is being paid. So how, how it works in practice, for example, if you're being paid on 30th of every month and today is 15th, you can get 50% of your salary upfront. Got it. So basically the whole idea is uh, you can get access to the cash and there's some underwriting that's going on in terms of you guys are fronting that money. There's probably a little bit of, uh, of a fee that you're taking for that. And uh, what it really does is uh, it allows people not have to wait for that next paycheck if they need to, you know, some sort of expense, et cetera. Exactly. So we effectively underwrite your salary, then we allow you to withdraw your salary early, proportionally to accrued days. Yeah. What's fascinating about this is, um, you know, I think it's the top four banks uh, in 2019 made about eight billion dollars in overdraft fees. Right? They essentially took money from people who didn't have money. Uh, and what's so interesting about it is when you start to unpack that data, uh, a lot of those overdraft fees are not because the people didn't have the money. It's because of exactly what you're addressing here, which is, uh, you know. They just have expenses that occur right before they actually get paid. So uh, rents due on you know the the twelfth. Uh, they've got a car payment on the thirteenth. The Netflix bill hits on the fourteenth. They get paid on the fifteenth. But somewhere in there, they overdraft, and then they're able to pay off what they owe plus the overdraft. And so this specific credit product sounds like you would essentially allow people to kind of avoid that overdraft situation, um, you know, by getting access to the capital early, which is uh, pretty impactful. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And then talk a little bit about with that product specifically, uh, the whole idea of like accrued days, uh, is that a risk man, uh, mitigation type, uh, you know, aspect to it or, or, or why not kind of front the entire, uh, you know, pay period, uh, and only do the accrued days. Well, at the, at the moment it's a bit, uh, risk mitigation. Uh, and then the reason for it is we, well, effectively we sell this product to companies as a, as a benefit for, for their employees. Uh, and because it's not a credit product, so we actually can advance to people what they actually earn. If we would advance people, you know, much more compared to what they earn, it would be a credit product. Got it. So really what you're doing is you're essentially building infrastructure. You're going to the corporations and you're saying, hey, here's a great product that you should offer to your employees as a perk. And then your relationship is with the corporation, not directly with the individual uh, employee. Um, so it's kind of a B2B to C type product more so than a B2C product. Exactly. Yeah. 
Yeah, ma- makes uh, makes a ton of sense. Um, talk to me about plans in the United States. Uh, so you guys have come to the United States. You've applied for the banking license. Anything specific in the U.S. that uh, that you're focused on or, uh, or or specifically excited about? So we're still building uh, the product for U.S. So ultimately, uh, the product should be at par compared to our European product uh, very shortly. And then initially, we want to start uh, targeting uh, the whole expat community in in U.S. So there are at least 40, 40 to 45 million people uh, in the U.S. who are not from U.S. Uh, originally and who still have a lot of connections uh, abroad. So our product allows them to have on day one global account and B allows them to send and receive money from Europe, from Australia, from Japan, from India uh, instantly and for free, avoiding any, any fees. Plus on top of it, if they want you know, to trade stocks, crypto, we're doing it at a better pricing compared to local stock brokers. Yeah, makes uh, makes a ton of sense. Before we get into the rapid fire questions to finish up, uh, I'm always fascinated by people who spend all day uh, building financial technology like yourself. Uh, what's your personal portfolio look like in terms of, uh, are you mostly allocated to cash, to stocks, to crypto? Just how do you think about investing your own money um, uh, across all these various asset classes? Yeah, good question. Uh, to be honest here, I mean, obviously, the you know, majority of my holdings are actually in the regular stocks, which are <laughs> private and uh, not, not tradable. Uh, in terms of stocks, I, I, I generally look at top five tech companies and then I'm, I'm along only. That's it. And then uh, crypto-wise, uh, well, to be honest, you last uh, one and a half years, I didn't do much because, you know, sorry, you know, price is too high. And then it went even higher, even higher. Now it crashed, but uh, I didn't do anything. Yeah, it, it's uh, it, it's one of these weird things where uh, people always forget technology entrepreneurs, for the most part, that uh, the idea that ninety you know plus percent of their net worth is tied up in the illiquid stock of their company is uh, is always true. But uh, but but obviously you've made a a great bet there, and uh, and the company has continued to accrue value. So I think you're doing just fine. Uh, but uh, but but pretty cool. Um, all right, I always ask the same three questions to uh to wrap up, and then you'll get to ask me one question to uh to finish us up. Uh, the first is what is the most important book that you've ever read? Well, good question. <laughs> I'm I'm uh, unprepared. To be honest, your uh, last ten years, I think you know the most enjoyable book I, I read. Maybe the last 15 years was uh, Principles by uh, Ray Dalio. But then uh, back then it wasn't even published. It was a simple PDF with uh, 50, 60 pages, which was actually yeah. much more brutal and honest compared to, to, to a book that was, uh, well, that was uh, kind of written with three or 400 pages, right? And the book is so pure polished that, you know, I didn't really recognize the initial PDFs that I read and enjoyed. The PDF, I could not agree more. The PDF is way better. It's way shorter. It's much more direct uh, and, and frankly, much more valuable. So uh, that's a great uh, insight. But uh, I, I think the PDF people can still get. Uh, if not, then you got to go read the book and uh, suffer through 400 pages rather than 50 or 60. But I uh, couldn't agree more there. Second question is around sleep schedule. So I used to sleep five or six hours, uh, you know, kind of badge of honor of not sleeping a lot. Uh, but my friends over at Eight Sleep sent me a uh, kind of thermoregulated bed. So I basically can turn it super cold. Now I sleep like eight or nine hours and completely changed uh, the way that I thought about sleep. What's your sleep schedule and how has that evolved over time as the business has gotten larger? To me also, I used to be the same, right? I used to sleep uh, five, six hours, you know, because, you know, I spend a lot of time, you know, on uh, travel as well uh, and on uh, external meetings. But then during COVID, I completely switched to eight, eight hours. So I, I, I effectively... Go to bed earlier. I get up earlier uh, at the training, uh, and then uh, similar as you, you know, preferably uh, cold temperature in the room. So eight, yeah. eight hours for me is, is optimal. Amazing. What you said? You go to bed early. What what time do you usually try to get to sleep by? Well, usually ten thirty. Oh yeah, yeah. So so uh, early by uh, tech standards, but normal by uh, the rest of the world standards. <laughs> uh, third question is aliens. Are you a believer or a non-believer? Uh, I think prob- probabilistically believer, right? I think you know most likely given the whole universe and you know billions of you know stars out there, uh, probability of uh, of some kind of uh, natural uh, connections, you know, between, you know, molecules to enable creation of DNK, you know, with time, uh, it's, it's very, very probable. So I, I, I am a believer. 
Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you that uh, uh, it's more likely than not, which uh, which is frankly all we can ask for. Uh, the bigger question, I guess, is just like, will we come in contact with them during my or your lifetime? But uh, that I'm less confident of, right? They're out there, but uh, maybe too far away for us. Um, you could ask me one question to, uh, to wrap us up here. What, uh, what one question you have for me? Uh, what do you enjoy the most in your podcast? Yeah, I mean, look, it's this. What, what, what do you enjoy, you know, when, when you speak with people, what do you enjoy the most? It, it's frankly, uh, you know, you spend all day thinking about uh, a very specific vertical in the world, right? You talked earlier about uh, you're, you're not focused on U.S. technology or Asia technology firms or whatever. You're focused on how do we build the best software, become the best uh, kind of financial services uh, application for our users, uh, be number one, uh, and then make sure that the economics of the uh, kind of the P&L stay number one as well. And so it's fascinating that, uh, you know, you and I can talk and uh, I can basically glean a lot of the information that uh, you spend all day thinking about. Um, and so when you do that over and over and over again across different verticals, you find that you just learn a lot, right? And so, you know, a, a easy learning already just off the top of my head was when you were talking about the fact that the crypto accounts uh, kind of have seen 2x the inflows to the stock accounts, right? I think that most people would uh, would think that, oh, the stock market's much larger, the stock market is more likely to, uh, to kind of have folks interested. Uh, but given the user base that you have and kind of the year um, that, that we saw over the last 12 months, uh, it's, it's just fascinating to me how popular crypto has gotten so quickly. Um, and so it's little things like that, which, you know, not groundbreaking on their own, but when you can start to piece that together through many conversations, uh, you start to just get a, a more nuanced, uh, kind of detailed version of the world, uh, which I think, it, you know, makes you better investor, makes you much uh, kind of just more well-rounded as well. Yeah, makes sense. All right. Where can we send people to find you on the internet or, uh, or learn more about Revolut? You have a Twitter account? Yeah, uh, at M. Staronsky. And obviously, website, Revolut.com. All right. So, Revolut.com or, uh, or your Twitter account are the two best places. Yep. Awesome. Well, listen, Nick, thank you so much for taking the time to do this, and we'll definitely have to do it again in the future. Thank you. See you.